and it also increases the amount of pace you have to put on it. You see all the pros, they, they get into this, this turn in this set position. The ball comes, see how he times the drop in the backswing? Essentially, we want you hitting the ball amazing. We don't want you to settle for mediocrity with your strokes, your technique, anything, okay? Don't have limiting factors in your mind because, you know, when I was young, I would just look around at players who could hit the ball amazing, and I couldn't. And I'd just say, oh, I had to be the player who pushed. I had to be the player who grinded and just ran a lot. But that is not true, okay? And that's why we're taking the next steps to really figuring this stuff out and not putting blanket statements over it and you know subjecting you to this harsh reality that you'll never hit the ball sweet and clean with power with accuracy and all those things okay it's understanding what i call a nuanced point now if you're a beginner like who picked up a racket like yesterday this video might not be the greatest for you okay if you're ready to take your next steps through tennis this probably will benefit your game in a big way. And the theme here is like good timing. What does good timing do for you as a player? Good timing is everything for you as a player. It's power, it's consistency, it's rhythm, right? It's all the things we want as a tennis player to execute better. So taking an early backswing, for instance, anytime you say early, it means you're not on time. So early is obviously better than being late but on time is better than being early. What's going on guys? It's Steven with 15 points of tennis. And we're gonna go myth busters on you today because there's so much just common knowledge out there that's just promulgated by all these tennis coaches. And you know what, most of it is true. All right, most conventional wisdom is true, but a lot of times it isn't 100% true, right? So as a beginner, it's great to go from you know, a C to C plus, a B minus to B, but if you want to get to B plus to A minus to A plus and really put your game on steroids, you got to go a little bit deeper with the concepts and understand the nuance point. And I take a slight risk here by making this type of video because my guess it will get misinterpreted, a little misconstrued because, again, I'm attacking common wisdom, but we're going to go into it anyways because I think you as my subscribers, are gonna enjoy it a little bit, all right? So what I teach a lot of my young students, okay? And I just say it because I know it's the easiest way to get started is what I call taking the racket back early. And so this is what's commonly taught. This is what you've probably been taught. This is what I was taught when I was like wee young, right? You take the racket back, we're going from pocket to, to ear, right? You get in the set position, and go from pocket to ear. And that's the best way to learn. First thing you do is you tell the kid, well, oh, take your racket back, right? Don't be late on the ball, be early. Well, I'm gonna tell you, and we're gonna talk about timing in more depth, but when we talk about timing, okay, good timing means neither being early nor late, all right? But let's get into it a little deeper. I mean, this is what Serena Williams does. She's one of the greatest ever. She's the GOAT of women's tennis absolutely phenomenal. It also proves you don't have to do everything 100% perfect to be a great, great player. You have to just do enough things perfect. But what Serena does is, first thing the ball comes, again, I love the shoulder turn. I think it's phenomenal. She gets turned quickly, but she gets this racket back dropped and set. And then she starts running to the ball, and then she lines herself up with the ball, and then she swings and hits. Right? We're going to show you, you know, both the Williams sisters do that. So I can easily make a video why Serena is the best and all the things she does perfect. I want to bring your attention to her early setback with the racket. The first thing she does, she sets there and holds and then swings. So she holds and then swings, okay? And this is what we're really going to focus on for today, for today and to contrast that with some of the other players on the tour, okay, to see the difference. I'm going to go on a limb here and say, and understand the argument, don't just click away from the video until you understand the argument, that this is not 100% credit. And here's why, look, when you take the racket back, you're hurting your, mo your, your ability to move, you're hurting your mobility. Like if I was to defend in basketball or any sport, I have my hands out front and relax. You see this, I can make quick nifty steps. Once I put my hands to my, my side or in an awkward position where I can't use my arms to counterbalance, well, it becomes much more awkward to move in space. So, not just on a backhand, imagine an overhead, right? The ball, let's say I'm, I have to move and hit these overheads. Well, when I'm hitting an overhead, if I, 
I put my hands up. Now, now a lot of the young kids have a hard time getting to this position. I get it, the trophy position. It's, so that's why we tell them to do that and get, the, and get set up early. But if you get set up too early at a higher level and you have to run, how awkward is it to move with your hands up the whole time or a short overhead, up, a short overhead and then hitting the ball? It's awkward, right? As opposed to, you know, moving when, when you should move, Again, you should have your arms out just like in any other sport. You should move here and then get your hands up at the right time and then hit. You should move here, set, and hit. All right? And that's where timing comes in. So how awkward does this really look? It pretty much looks like I'm a penguin waddling around. And I see this all the time with beginner and intermediate level players. I'm still going to get my hands up, not early, but on time. So if I'm hitting a deep overhead, I'm gonna go up, I'm running, and then I get the hands up. If I'm running, I'm gonna get the hands up, and then I hit. Don't take my word for this. Try this out on the courts yourself. Now notice my ability to move with much more balance, okay? And then I'm obviously timing my hands as they go up, of course. But one of the big things, with, let's say hitting an overhead or any of your strokes, is a relaxation of your upper body. Okay, you do not want your upper body tense, and this is allowing me to keep my body fairly relaxed. Again, and when you're relaxed, you're gonna generate much more power and a lot much more speed. Now, the second thing we talk about is getting the racket back early. What it also can do is a lot of times Serena will, you know, drop the racket, get the racket back early, move to the ball here, you know, line herself and space with the ball, and then kind of watch my racket tip do a little, a little, kind of a little startup loop and then hit the ball, which is kind of okay. Well, she's Serena Williams, she can, she can do a lot of things, all right? But for most people, what they do when they get the racket back early, and I don't know if this happened to you or people you know, they get the racket back early, and now when they generate power, they have to start their swing from a static cold position, and they have no, there's no momentum here to help them, right? As opposed to, you look at Murray, you look at Djokovic, who have the, have the set point, they keep the racket head up like this, and they time the backswing into the ball. When I talk about timing the backswing now, you have momentum in, in the drop of the racket and the timing to propel the, their kinetic chain forward and let their kinetic chain take over from there. It's a big difference. Fed too, he holds up, he, he has this racket up, and as the ball comes, see how he times the drop in the backswing before he hits? It's a big difference from rack it back early, rack it back early, impede your mobility, impede your momentum, and then try to hit the ball. So of course, Serena actually has, on an absolute scale, one of the best backhands on tour, but I want you to notice how, look, when she holds a racket there, she has to, again, take another loop, and this is kind of her saving grace, because although she holds it in a still position, she still gets rhythm and power because she goes back and then she takes a, a separate loop after she takes the racket back. She takes a separate loop and swings. All right, I think this is much tougher than just taking one loop from the get-go. As you see, Annie Murray can hold and then take a loop, right? So he'll set in his whole position and then use that momentum to go right into the ball. And this is typically you, you see, you know, across the board, you know, Djokovic and Murray, slightly better backhands, again, using every bit of that momentum to the shot. So when we talk about timing, right, and, I all, and like I said before, you know, good timing is essential to everything we do in tennis. Hitting the sweet spot, hitting with power, hitting with consistency, executing with, you know, time and time again and under pressure, right? Good timing solves so many problems, right? That's why being early is better than being late. Of course, if you're late to the ball and the ball goes by, they hit a winner. So being early on the ball is better than being late, but being on time is better than being early, right? If you're early to the ball, you, you've lost so much power. And we use the example of kicking a soccer ball all the time. If I were to run into the soccer ball, stop like this, and kick, I have very little power compared to if I get to the soccer ball on time, now I have my momentum that's pushing me up into the ball. Same with the backhand, right? If I hop, step, stop, and hit, 
versus if I hop step and I run, move into the ball with, with speed and momentum, oh man, that, that is a world of difference. So that's why we talk about timing so heavily and not just timing with the footwork and the feet, but I'm talking about timing with the backswing, okay? It's easier and to learn how to just, oh, backswing early, right? Oh, get to the ball early like this and, and hit, right? Backswing early and hit. But again, if you wanna level up and reach that higher level, you've gotta start understanding these more nuanced concepts. So that's why Fed, for instance, you know, when he, he hits his short ball, you don't see him take his racket back here and run up to the short ball like this, or you know, when, when a ball is deep, you, don't see, you never see the pros run like this with a racket back. That's kind of crazy. Well, I mean, I guess Serena does it sometimes like this, but you know, I love Serena. Anyways, you know, a lot, when they hit a short, when Fed hits a short ball, for instance, his hands are here, and then, and then at the right moment, he times his hands, okay? Again, you know, on, on that wide ball, he times his hands with the ball. He times his hands with the ball, his feet with the ball, and that's the beauty of a backswing that has good timing and creates true momentum and power versus one that is just preset and has to start from a cold static position. Now, a classic example of what I just talked about, okay? You're gonna see a short ball after this shot, but his hands are gonna be set in front. Now it's gonna take back and hit. Uh, this one's a little bit more obvious, okay? You're gonna see defensive play right here. Okay, on the run, his hands are in front of him as he runs, and then the backswing as he sets and goes for the winner. Now we're gonna go a little step deeper into this next part, okay? Sort of the how-to. And although I talk about, don't misconstrue this, although I talk, this is a nuanced point here. Although I talk about, I don't like early racket take back. I like early racket preparation and unit turn. I'm in favor of early racket preparation and unit turn. So what is that? Early racket preparation. I, might, I don't have my arms limp and my racket not ready. My racket is out. There's tension in my, not tension, but you know, I'm using my muscles, my core is engaged, but I'm relaxed, I'm bent at the hips. Of course I can, you're in a ready position, right? And, and I can turn here in my set position. So I'm ready, I'm, I'm loaded, but I didn't take the racket back here. That's a big difference, okay? Having a quick unit turn, and you see all the pros, they, they get into this, this turn in this set position, but it's not with the racket taken back where they have to generate power again. They're in a set position so they can set and hold with strength. Hold, 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 and start their, their swing at any time. You can hold here and then swing. But again, they're, they can hold here and their back swing starts in rhythm. Now, I want to break that down technically. So what's going on here? All right, when you take a backswing, what is really a backswing? You can take the racket back with your hand. I get that, okay? And some people have a big backswing. Think about Fernando Gonzalez or Juan Martin Del Potro. Some of these players take a bigger backswing, all right? But what do we know about the kinetic chain? When we talk about the kinetic chain, it's controlled by your big muscles first to start and your small muscles to finish. And so when, when I take my unit turn or racket prep, whether I take a big backswing or a small backswing, my hands don't move much. So watch this. I'm in a ready position here. I'm going to unit turn, right, slash get the racket prep. The question is how much did my hands move? I'll show you from this angle. So they didn't move hardly at all, right? All I did was, was a unit turn here, and it kind of looks like I took the racket back. Now, you know, in the online accelerator part, you know, course, we talk about getting the shoulder loaded, et cetera, you know, which is getting the shoulder back and loaded here, and I can feel the, the tension and the torque in my shoulder. So, but either coupled with this, this, and this, you see how I get to that position? I'm not taking the racket back and letting, leaving myself susceptible to having to start up the motor again from there, right? Because again, timing the backswing, whether you're playing baseball or anything, you know, boom, boom, I, I can't hold this position indefinitely or else I start losing power. Now, when I, I turn into this uh, holding position of strength right here, where I'm hol holding my shot, first of all, my grip, and we'll talk about, you know, grip tightness in another video, but I'm holding it firm enough where there's no wobbling of the racket. 
Once the racket starts to wobble, that creates instability. And we're gonna talk about like all technique is efficiency of movement. Like when I talk about, you know, this position of strength, my racket is still up. If my racket was down here, well, I lost the momentum of the racket drop. I want to be able to drop the racket and create momentum in, into the shot. If I drop my racket and stopped, that's called energy wasted. Repeat, energy wasted. And energy wasted is essentially the same thing as bad technique. Good technique maximizes energy efficiency. Okay, whatever you got, you can be weak, you can be strong, but if you maximize efficiency of energy, I guarantee you're gonna hit the ball pretty darn good or a lot better than you think, okay? So I wanna get to this unit turn and racket prep as soon as I possibly can. So watch Andy, you see his racket up, his wrists are not laid back yet, but you see the quick unit turn, this is the first thing that happens. Notice how much shoulder turn he gets. He gets so much shoulder turn, his opponent can see the back of his shoulder blade. And same for the students, okay? What I wanna see a quick unit turn and that's one thing the hand feeds do, it reduces the time you have to react and it also increases the amount of pace you have to put on it because there's no pace on the ball. So you want that massive shoulder turn to drive through every single shot. Alright, so that wraps up this video. It's a little bit of a one-off, a little kind of a niche topic, but look, all these one percenters that you're learning, whether it's a one percenter, two percenter, three percenter, you do ten of these things and look, three, four months from now, you're, you're, winning, like, you're winning three times more matches. That's how it works. Almost all your improvement, once you hit a certain level, will be mastering each of these points one at a time. And then you're gonna look back six months from now. You're gonna look back from year now, and your average day is gonna be your best day that you had six months ago, right? And you're gonna, that's the consistent improvement that you wanna see because you're adding all these nuance points to your game, not just these blanket statements that are good in most cases, but they don't work perfectly, all right? And that's really the trademark of an advanced, advanced player. All right, thanks so much. That subscribe button right over there on that bottom right-hand side. Hit that button. Again, it helps me, the channel, so much to push out content for you guys. If this video isn't published before Thanksgiving, I wish you guys a wonderful holiday Thanksgiving and comment below. I'm glad to... I want to see, really see if these concepts are landing, whether it's making an impact in your game, whether these are easy to grasp for some of you guys, again, because I'm not there to work in person. Of course, you can always hit me below. I'll leave the links below. Follow me on Facebook, on Instagram for some of my short, snappy, practical content, right? That's not quite like my YouTube content, a little bit different, and the Online Accelerator Program. If you had not yet had the chance to come to California to work with me in person, all right? I appreciate you guys for watching. Thank you and I'll see you on the next video.